It's actually Dr. Jennifer Clark. Yes. What do you have your PhD? Actually, I'm a clinical health psychologist. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I don't do oh, you and I have a lot of talks about it, honey. When we get done with this yep. session, I gotta, you and I are going to become best friends yes. here at immediately. It helps. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Very good. And your master's in public health, what right. was that about? Uh, it was primarily about understanding risk, how to modify both primary and secondary risk, and implement strategies for change in the clinical setting. Tell us more. Yeah, so, well, that kind of relates to what we do at the survivorship. Yeah, center. And, yeah. and tell me, and uh, uh, you're at the University of Kansas. I am. And, and is that on the, that's on the Kansas side of the board. It is on the Kansas board, side, and we are the Jayhawks, so we are the practitioner you know, bird. Oh, yeah, you don't want to shut up. Right. <laughs> that's right, so we're on the Kansas side, and we also are a unique setting in that we're an academic medical center. Sure. We have 10 community-based practice locations, and then we have a rural network called our Midwest Cancer Alliance. Actually, I have, uh, they've left now, but I have real good friends in Wichita, yep. and which is part of your program, Steve Smith. and. Some of my surgery friends yes. were out in, the, in Wichita, yep. which is a great medical community. It is a great right? medical community, but yeah. we have a very um, kind of fragmented medical community across sure. the state. So a lot of what I do is develop programs that can be disseminated both <laughs> at the academic setting, the community setting, and then throughout our rural network. Jennifer, uh, what we're doing today is we're streaming live right now with the target of our medical colleagues. Great. But we will also be uploading these videos uh, to genomic site, to breastcanceranswers.com, okay. which I'll tell you more about later. Um, so I want to sort of have your comments be directed, if you will, to both our medical colleagues who survivorship is this big sure. amorphous area it out is. there. It is. And also to women. Uh, my experience has been that finishing breast cancer treatment is like running the marathon. Right. You come out the other end of it, yeah, and you're, you're looking around like, well, what's next? Where are all the doctor appointments? Where are all That's the other exactly things? Right. What, what, what do I do? Mm -hmm. So tell us, please, about your right. program and what's going on. Sure. So I think one of the first things, um, we opened the Breast Cancer Survivorship Center in Kansas in 2006. Okay. And I've sort of used that as a test kitchen to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, but if we truly define our patients as survivors from the time of diagnosis, right. which I think complicates things a little. So we yeah. have that definition. And then we have truly post-treatment care. Right. Um, but if we start defining it from that time of diagnosis, it allows allows us to do preventive education and intervention earlier. So if we could talk about weight control, especially for a lot of our breast cancer patients. Absolutely. If we could talk about keeping moving for fatigue management and cognition. Yep. So I think it's important to think about what could we do up front that's preventative, and then what do we want to do as that patient transitions through the continuum of care? What happens when they do finish treatment? What if they're on an, an anti-hormonal therapy for yep. the next five, 10, who knows how many years? Well, as of this meeting, it might I be know, 10 apparently, years now. Yeah, that, that was the yes. big news story yesterday yeah. was 10 years of tamoxifen from, mm -hmm. from the UK study. That's right. And interesting, last night in the nightly news on NBC, I think it was the number three story, yeah. on ABC it was the number two story. It was a hot story, uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. You're, we're so, both going to be dealing with this when we get back home. Absolutely. So, yeah. so I think that if you conceptualize survivorship in a post-treatment population, thinking about them being on endocrine therapy, you're talking about managing their late effects. How do we keep them adherent? Right. How do we make sure that we're understanding their needs and really empowering the patient to be part okay. of the process? So I'm somewhat altruistic, uh, but we've built a multidisciplinary clinic. So it's cardio-oncology, fertility, endocrine, long-term care. Wow. And having that landscape allows us to manage patients as we go into the next phase of survivorship care, which depending on what type of institution you live in, sure. um, there's survivorship care planning mandates where we actually give a patient a piece of paper right. not a lot of evidence to support that piece of paper right. but how do we use technology to help us and my opinion is that you need to have a landscape to help the patients take those next steps before we start telling them what their risks are okay so give us an example mm -hmm. so we've got physicians watching this and later on there'll be right. patients watching us take us sort of step by step way through we understand the multidisciplinary approach but it was some what does it look like in real? Exactly. Yeah. What's it look like in real? So how it plays out in an ideal setting is that um, my practice has always been cancer risk and genetic counseling. Okay. So I see a lot of younger women in particular. Right. So if we take a young endocrine positive woman, um, recently diagnosed, we uh, cross-section with her usually when the surgeon sees her. So we're able to provide cancer risk and genetic counseling, get testing started, yeah, right. and then also educate her on some basic survivorship planning. Okay important to know what resources we have available so navigation can kind of help with that but also just a few words we want you to keep moving on days you feel well yep. we want you to stay weight neutral 
We don't want you to gain weight. We don't want you to lose weight. And we want you to know there's going to be lots of things that will happen, and we just need you to be empowered to talk with us about that. Okay. So just some simple upfront because they get so yeah, much and information. And so is, describe sort of mm. specifically the mechanism. Is it the navigators who are monitoring that, right. or do you have other people who, involved? Mm -hmm. who are, who are those the people? Yeah, who's the team? The How team does it work? It's heavily dependent on our navigators and our nurse clinicians, uh -huh. but we have also have um, buy-in from our physicians, so from our oncologists and surgeons, yep. who are now mimicking that same message of keeping uh -huh. moving and exercise. So that's my dream come true. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and then our partners in cardiology or in endocrine, we all have the same messaging in regards to lifestyle. So when we send a patient, wow. um, so take that young patient, yep. maybe she still got an anthracycline, yep. maybe she got left chest wall radiation, yep. plus she has a family history of heart disease. She's uh, has a BMI of 30. Um, you know, two thirds of our patients are overweight when they enter our practice. Yeah, right. So you take that patient, and we have a uh, three tiers of cardio oncology. We have acute, subacute, and screening. Wow. So acute and subacute are for patients who may be symptomatic during right. treatment. We may need to delay treatment. Right. We want to keep them on track. Screening are really for those women who are at higher risk, and maybe we added to that risk. Okay. Um, so they can get a good plan from the cardiologist. Most of the time, the cardiologist does not continue monitoring them. They actually send yeah. them back to primary care, but we okay. give them a recipe. Okay. So we're taking that more holistic approach, and as we get more mandated to demonstrate coordinated care, right. I think survivorship is an excellent model at, if we can develop that infrastructure for not only caring for our patients and their lean effects better, but demonstrating coordinated care. Okay, hold on for just one second. This is a fascinating interview. Todd, back to you for just a minute. Do you want to make a quick announcement? Dr. Harness, I just got a question from Susanna. I know the, um, the zip code because it looks like Miami, Florida to me, and she writes, at our cancer center, we say we're comprehensive, but we don't provide a survivorship program. Yep. What steps mm -hmm. should we take to get one? Oh, fantastic oh, question. Thank by you the way, yeah, <laughs> well, is that a setup question, huh? Yeah. Thank you for sending that in. And by the way, as you as you've heard, people are actually That's sending great. top questions. Good. So it shows that they're out yeah, there. Okay. They're listening. Well, go ahead and answer. Sure. Yeah. So um, one of my jobs is logistics and problem solving. So yeah. when we opened our center in 2006, I'm a firm believer of sharing and transfer of knowledge. Right. You know, I've made mistakes. We've tried things that work yeah. and don't work. We're a test yeah. kitchen. Yeah. Um, so we actually built a, an e-learning solution called Cancer Survivorship Training or CancerSurvivorshipTraining.com. Okay. And what that's really oh, meant... Oh, slow down. Oh, I know you I talk, talk fast. You talk I do. <laughs> Repeat that website sure. again. Sure. CancerSurvivorshipTraining.com. CancerSurvivorshipTraining.com. Yes. All right. So it's actually a startup at the University of Kansas, right. but it's its own separate entity. Okay. But it's meant to build a nomenclature so that we can all speak the same language right. and we can start training our, our primary care collaborators. It's not fair to say, well, they can't be part of the team or they don't have enough knowledge sure. if we never train them to have that knowledge. Right. So this is meant to be an e-learning tool where you can get continuing medical education credits, wow. um, nurses, physicians, built on an interprofessional platform, which is really where education Yes. needs to go and train our team. Uh, one of the courses as part of that is actually how do you develop, build, and sustain a survivorship program. Very good. I have limited resources. I have to stretch every dollar we have. I need to build for everything humanly possible. Yeah. And so we give you the tools to help do that okay. in your practice setting. Yeah, but what I've noticed is you have boundless energy. I do. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I keep going. <laughs> But one of the goals, and I think this is so important in building survivorship care yeah. and how we deliver care, yeah. is that we all want to build a Cadillac, but a Toyota Corolla that runs for 30 years is a great car too. <laughs> and so I think I one of the it. things that, that uh, we really tried to do is how do we build a minimum standard of care yeah. that improves access for our patients, yeah. hopefully improves outcomes, okay. but allows us to take those stepwise process to get to you know the Cadillac. Yeah. So. Well, one of the, when we get, I told you right when you sat down that I wanted to talk to you when we get offline from our live broadcast this morning. Let me share with you, I'm involved with what's called NCCCP. Mm -hmm. That's the National Cancer Center's Community Cancer Program. My hospital in Orange County, California, was one of the original, whatever it was, 18 hospitals selected. Survivorship is one of the pillars and okay. one of the things. Uh, we now have, I think, 24 sites uh, as we go forward, and um, I'm going to be passing your information on to the, to the national level as as, as well. That'd be great. Uh, yeah, uh, you clearly are going to be needing some more resources <laughs> to, do, to be do. able to to do all mm -hmm. this. 
So what are the next steps? So I think the next steps are really this changing landscape. You know, if you right. look at the stats, in the 70s we had about 3 million survivors. Today we have 13 million. 2020, 2022, yeah. 18 million cancer survivors. Yeah. The oldest model of keeping cancer survivors in an oncologic practice isn't realistic, and it's not financially realistic. Right. So how do we transition the patients? How do we assess what their late-term effects are? How do we educate them on preventing or identifying those? And the complexity that, to, you know, probably two to three, two-thirds of our patients have at least two major comorbidities. So they have, right. you know, hypertension. Tension, so, Jennifer, overweight. we've got physicians sitting out there thinking, I think this, I'm, I'm sure they're thinking, you're thinking, you think? right? <laughs> you're thinking this is just the most fantastic thing they've heard about. But then they have to deal with the reality of reimbursement. Mm -hmm. and, and how, so tell us how you've looked at the whole issue of reimbursement. Sure. Uh, for uh, the cardiology thing, it seems to me it's pretty easy. Right. But some of the primary care and some of the other, how have you been able to model that so it financially? Financially, that makes sense. So yeah. all of those follow-up visits we do in post-treatment care are uh -huh. built just like you would build a normal follow-up visit. Okay. Part of what we've done is taken technology to try to help us be more efficient. Such, so, such, as, such right? as every time patients come in, we go through sort of a 20-point question with okay. them. And once we spend a little more time up front, our navigator actually goes through that with the patient. Right. This is what survivorship means. We want to put you back together. We're going to ask you these questions every time you come in. Bone health, menopausal symptoms, right. weight. And make sure that not only do we have some measurable outcomes, mm -hmm. but we, if we have have an option for um, managing that risk, we can help the patient achieve that. So one of the things that, that we've tried to do is really empower the patient to be part of the process. And then every time they come back in for subsequent visits, they know those are the questions okay. that are answered. Um, so technology helps. And then we're working with our EHR vendor as well sure. to build in tools so that from day one, when a patient enters your practice, you're collecting the necessary data to build the tools Perfect. at the end. Because That's if funny. you have to go back and do a survivorship care plan. Not only you're right. It's who's not your, who's your vendor? We are uh, we use Epic as our vendor, okay. and very Epic good. has been yeah. very helpful, yeah. um, and will launch in next quarter um, the first template for survivorship care plan. Oh, that's perfect, yeah. and that really fits in with all of where we're going yep. with electronic medical records. You have, that's our experience as well. Absolutely, you really need to build the survivorship piece of this up front. It, it has you know? to be. You know, yeah. technology has to be our friend. Right. It's somewhat more labor intensive sometimes when you're in clinic and you have right. to get your right. notes done, but um, if we don't build these tools, our providers aren't going to be able to systematically right. offer that to okay. our patients. One other quick thing, and then Todd's just signaled me that we want you to, we're going to assume, no, 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 we, first of all, you're not to leave after we go <laughs> okay. offline. But uh, secondly, we want to do like a two-minute summary for okay. those who may have tuned in late. One thing I haven't heard you talk about, and we'll only be brief on this, is the psychological changes mm -hmm. that patients go. Right. So many of my, I've been at this 27 years, so many of my patients say, my life is forever changed. Right. Uh, husbands often think, well, honey, we're just going back to where we were before. Forget that idea. New normal. New mm -hmm. normal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. How are you dealing with that aspect? Of yeah, it? I think one of the things we have not traditionally done well is provide patients with realistic expectations right. up front. Right. So if you know you're going to have changes in body image because right. of surgery or because right. of weight, you know, it's a lot easier to handle. You may not like it right. if you're prepared for it. Right. So how do we take that patient and we douse them with information up front? You know, they go through chemo education. Education right. and so forth. Right. But I really think they need some more of that survivorship education because if you can prepare them up front, then they're better equipped to handle problems okay. or identify problems. Um, I think that, that obviously we have things like distress scales that are supposed to help us right. um, identify patients, yeah. but we also need good resources for those patients as next steps. And there, that, there, there you go. And that's what I want to talk so to you about hard. after we go right. offline. Yeah. So give us uh, the sort of Reader's Digest summary Version of what, of uh, what you're sure. doing for those who may have tuned okay. in late. Okay. So I think cancer survivorship is a changing landscape. Um, we have many more cancer survivors due to you know, improved diagnostics, uh, targeted therapies, um, and just patient advocacy. Now that we have this great problem that we have to deal with, we need to have efficient solutions in caring for our patients wow. long term. And we need good ways to educate our providers and our patients. And so that's why Cancer Survivors of Training was built, and hopefully we can get that message out to folks across the country. Um, listen, what a total delight to have you here, Thank you Jennifer. so much. And we're going to talk some more. Thank Sounds you good. very, very much. Mm -hmm.